married man that I knew was married. The feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Cool TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk. We're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, the government says it's dealing with a migration emergency after the busiest day for channel crossings in 2024 so far. London is no longer safe for Jewish people. That's according to an Israeli minister who calls the capital the most anti-Semitic city in the West. And a detector has struck gold, literally, and unearthed the largest gold nugget ever found in England. He'll be on the show live with some gold. And now, we're going to need a bigger boat. All this talk of a falling birth rate and a need to rely more heavily on immigration to keep our economy afloat sounds like a recipe for disaster in Britain. Parts of the country have been changed irrevocably since the Blair regime opened up the country to foreign workers and their families. And even as we speak, communities around the country are being forcibly altered as more and more migrants are being housed in more and more residential areas. Yesterday, the Home Office proudly declared that the number of asylum seekers staying in hotels is down 36% in the last six months. They claim that by the end of the month, 100 hotels would have been returned to their ordinary use. And if their asylum claims had failed and they were all being deported, that might be something to boast about. But that's not what's happening. A grand total of 50 people were deported last week, just 50. They are simply being moved out of hotels and into rented accommodation, and we, I'm afraid, are footing the bill. More and more private landlords are applying for HMO status, that's houses of multiple occupancy, in order to rent them out to asylum seekers. It's happening up and down the country, and meanwhile, thousands more are arriving on small boats by the week. Welcome to your future. Now, speaking of asylum, Downing Street has declared a migration emergency after the busiest day for channel crossings so far this year. A Home Office revealed on Wednesday that more than 500 migrants made the journey with 10 boats detected in the water. Let's bring in tonight's special panel, editor of Spikes Online, Tom Slater, political analyst Alice, Alice Grant, and journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler. Very warm welcome to all of you. Um, what a day. I mean, there's been so much going on today that has been more negative for uh, Rishi Sunak. We haven't even mentioned there that the Tories have now reached their lowest point this year so far, back down to 19% where they were when Liz Truss was Prime Minister. Um, and then we get the news that more than 500 people have come over in one fell swoop because the weather's rather nice and it's just going to get worse. So I don't see how they can even go till Easter, this lot, never mind till October. I'd be amazed. I mean, especially when you think about how central stopping the boats was to Rishi Sunak's yeah. whole programme. This is how he was going to rescue his chances, rescue his, his party's chances. And did anyone really think he was going to get a grip on it? He never really seemed no. to... No. Only he, only he to was do the only was one necessary. that thought he was going to do it, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And now this is another pledge that lies in tatters. The only pledge that they've managed to fulfil is the one that everyone knew would happen anyway, which is inflation coming yeah. up. So, which has got nothing to do with them. Absolutely. Right. So it's not looking good for them, definitely. It really isn't. Alice? Yeah, I think this is perceived as enormously weak, um, yeah. not just in, within Britain, but on the international stage. I mean, we're a country who can't seem to control our borders, and anyone serious about the economy, as Rishi Sunak claims to be, yeah. would be very concerned for our welfare state, which is at its brink, breaking mm. point, really, well, it um, is. with the NHS. Well, I this mean, is the thing. We've yeah. got, I mean, we talk about this a lot. Um, and We've got nine million people now who are economically inactive, some of them because they're students, but most of them because they're not working. Some of them have never worked. And I don't know how... Any government, including a Labour government, if possible, uh, that that's the next one. I don't know how they get those people to work. Yeah, precisely. There is a crisis, but I think the most important thing is that this is something which was so central to the Brexit vote. It was about control mm. over our, our territory, our waters, our laws, and none of these promises have been adequately fulfilled since then. Right. We're still tied economically to the EU in certain respects. We're still having problems just controlling and policing our seas. Yeah. I mean, this is ridiculous. They need to step up. Yeah. But, I mean, at the moment, I think they've lost that chance. And now we're going to face 10 years of a Labour government in which all these problems will become worse. Yeah. And it's a, it's a real heartbreak for our country. I think so. I'm going to be making an argument later on in this hour, Sam, that the, the Conservative Party, actually, as we know it, is finished. Mm. 
Well, I mean, like Alex just said, I don't think it's time for them to step up. I think it's time for them to step down, really. I mean, is the, I mean, there's there's an argument to be said that calling a general election sooner rather than later will mean that they can palm all the problems that are currently, you know, currently going on that's straight onto Labour and say, like, oh, look, yeah. look, you can't deal with immigration. Right. You've been in power for, like, two months. It's not very patriotic, though, is well, it? No. Just hand a horrible, nasty palm. No, it, no, it, is, no, it <laughs> isn't. But, I mean, yeah. let's be the honest, then... He's not, they're not going to be able to change things at this point. Obviously, immigration is a um, an illegal immigration is a thorn in their side, and you know, when seeing and as the weather gets better, it's just going to get worse and worse. And it's and suddenly, suddenly, it's, they're going to be back in the hotels again, and people and people are going to be right. up in arms. So, I mean, there's 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 no other real excuse other than to call a general election yeah. sooner rather than later. Well, this is the thing. I mean, I put out um, this tweet actually. Funnily enough, during the show yesterday, because I spotted it from the Home Office, that the, 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 the reduction in people being put up in hotels has you know, it's gone down by 36%. And I just asked the question, well, I wonder where they've gone? Because obviously they haven't been <laughs> deported. We've only deported 50 people, all of whom were criminals, so presumably they were in prison, and then when they got freed from prison, they were simply sent back home. So they're basically going into... And I got such an incredible response from, from people who, who watch this show and listen to this show from all parts of, of Britain saying, oh, yes, in our, in our street we've got, you know, two houses that have been made into multiple occupancy, uh, they've now got asylum seekers in them, you know, instead of six-bedroom house, it's now a ten-bedroom, you know, multiple occupancy mm -hmm. unit. And it's happening from sort of Lower Stoft up to Glasgow, down to Exeter, you know, everywhere in the country yeah. these people are being distributed. I even heard a story today that there are Westminster Council is actually putting people up in some rather swanky <laughs> addresses around the back of St James's. And that not only are they being put up there, families of, of, uh, of, of people who have come here seeking asylum, but, you know, every day something new arrives for them. is a new fridge or is a new cooker or some kind of white goods coming from John Lewis. I mean, it's a racket. It's people are not going to put up with this. It's, it's terribly it's, unjust. And it's, it's also just so superficial, though, because that's one thing. They were like, we need to get a grip on the hotels because everyone's heard about how much it's costing. People are seeing it in their local community. The place that is not only the employer, but the wedding venue is suddenly right. out of bounds. So we've got to do something about it. But as you said, they just moved the problem around. It's a bit like the Rwanda scheme. Mm. Even if everything went perfectly to plan from here on out, which is inconceivable, frankly, yeah. because of how they handled it so far, even if everything went perfectly to plan, you're talking about a few hundred people being taken to Rwanda. It's, mm. it's purely symbolic at this point, but symbolism yeah. is all they've got left. Seems like. Symbolism is all they've got left, and Rwanda <laughs> seems to be all they've got left, and they even have worked out that there's no point in trying to get that through uh, the Houses of Parliament before Easter, because they know it's probably not going to work, so they don't want to get defeated now. Mm -hmm. They think they'd rather get defeated later. <laughs> I mean, white, it was a white elephant from the start. It was yeah. never going to work, and, and obviously it was so much money, so much money being given to the Rwandan government, and we haven't seen a single plane get t taken yeah. off. And, it, and like you said, even if it had gone through, it still would have been minimal, minimal amount. So yeah. what was the point of it all? I know. Other, than to, other than to pile further embarrassment on the Tory party. Well, all that seems to have happened is we've given Rwanda a load of money, yeah. um, which they've said, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it might not be enough, but you know, it's a good start. <laughs> no, literally, that's so embarrassing. It's ridiculous. I can't believe it. To think they had an 80-seat majority yeah. um, with Boris. It's hard to and imagine, And they isn't it? totally squandered it. Yeah. I mean, there is no excuse for this. Is this shocking? And, you know, the only thing that makes me feel less embarrassed is that actually it's seems that it's not our country which is incapable of being incompetent as well, but also apparently many others across mm. Europe and yeah. America too. But what is going on in politics? Something needs to change I know. because this is unacceptable. Well, I mean, when we see as well in this new poll, I mean, Labour 25 points ahead of the Tories, but mm. Reform only four points behind. I mean, that's got to worry them as well, isn't it? It really should. But I'd be amazed if they were so surprised. First of all, how dreadful things have been for yeah. so long. But also, as impressive as that 80-seat majority was, it was always kind of slightly fragile as far as it's a yeah. new coalition. Do they really trust you yet? You've yeah. got to deliver for them. Right. Things have got really also, volatile. Most of the now. People, people are shopping to around. get Brexit done. Absolutely. And Brexit was, yeah. didn't get done. And people at the Red Wall were taking a risk. <laughs> they were thinking, you know, I've yeah. never I've never voted Tory in my whole mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Yeah. I might just do it this time, which is the, yeah. obviously the, the, the Red Wall is going to collapse instantly as soon as as soon as there's a general election. So I mean they'll lose eight, they'll lose I those eighty six. Collapse straight for away. the Tories, maybe. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, I don't know whether Labour gets it back though, because reform could do an awful lot better than everybody thinks. I think it, it's quite plausible that Labour could win a lot of those seats back by default yes. because of the fact that not only does the Tory vote collapse, they'll lose some to reform. Mm. I think a lot of those working class voters in particular are probably going to go back to not 
voting. Right. They're just sick of the lot of them. Right. So I think even if Labour win very handsomely next time around, it's also going to be fragile mm. because yeah. of the fact that everyone knows no one's enthusiastic for Keir Starmer. Right. I, think, I think the real pain here is the loss of momentum that was created because of Brexit. Yeah. There was such a lot of hope, um, a hope of you know, an empowered future for Britain, yeah. one which we were in control, we had our sovereignty yeah. back, there was so much we can do with that. Absolutely. And instead of pursuing um, you know, a positive vision for Britain, what they've done is they've effectively well, they squandered it. they botched it, didn't they? I mean, they and I accept that, you know, COVID, you know, COVID didn't exactly help. But I remember, yeah. you know, when that sort of January 31st came around 2021, or 2020, I suppose mm -hmm. it was, wasn't it? Um, the Brexit vote was in 2019. So, yeah, end of January. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went to a party. It was very, you know, the, the, there was a lot of sort of hope. There was exactly. a lot of um, happiness and people yeah. were like, this is going to be great, actually. We can do all these things. Yeah. And then suddenly COVID came. And then mm. it all got botched. And, and I think Northern Ireland is a good example of where it all went wrong, where you've now got Sinn Féin in charge of the, of the, of the local assembly um, who are going to push for a united Ireland. And, you know, before the end of, you know, maybe um, the decade, you're going to see a possible vote in Ireland for a united Ireland, which, well, we, which united may result in the breakup of the United Kingdom. But you could see a united kingdom that was Wales and England. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. You know, if they vote, let's, let's say let's say they, let's say Scotland votes votes out as well. And then, I don't and then, think no. I don't yeah. think they will. But I mean, if Ireland goes, we're going to call ourselves. But if, if Ireland, yeah, exactly. It's bad use of royal England as well, because you know they'll they'll only be the king of England. I think Scot yeah. I think Scotland is safe so long as Hamza Yusuf remains in power. Though, yes. like a kind of is the sort of double agent for the union. Yeah. Sort of. I mean, he has managed to turn the SNP into a, a real force against independence, isn't he? <laughs> which is fantastic. A hell of a job. Yeah. He's done terribly we, well. We love you, Yusuf. Yeah. Um, because you know no. Labour or, or Tory politician could manage to do that, but he's managed to do it. He's yeah. managed to make the SNP a party actually, mm -hmm. you know, that will never achieve independence. But, <laughs> but, but it, I mean, it's bad news if Northern Ireland goes because, no. you know, that's effectively quite a large chunk of, of the union, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, shocking. But also, like, a lot of, I have a lot of Northern Irish friends. I mean, there are there was a great swathes, millions of people that don't want to be part, don't want to unify Ireland. No, of course. You know, they want to remain part. Well, that's part why of Northern Ireland is there. Yeah, well, ex exactly. So I think, you know, I think, like, unlike, unlike Alice, who thinks it's going to be ten years of, of hell with the with with Keir Starmer, I do think I do think that we have to try and be positive. I mean, I'm, I'm I would say I was a centrist and I've, I've voted for both sides, but I think you know it's they've made such a terrible job of it. I don't see how it could possibly get worse. I mean, don't quote me on that. Like, <laughs> okay, don't quote me on that this time next year. Back. <laughs> about a year's time ago. Look, I told you it would get worse. You went away my flak jacket to get yeah. inside the building. <laughs> you're, in, you're in luck, though, because coming up after this, you've got Never Mind the Ballots, a brand new show uh, with Harry Cole from The Sun, the political editor, and he's interviewing uh, Sir Keir Starmer. So that'll be something that will be very well worth watching. Right after this, you're watching right now, though, the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. What if London is apparently the most anti Semitic city in the West, says the Minister of Israel. Don't move a muscle. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, sir. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Woke London is the most anti-Semitic city uh, in the West, according to an Israeli minister. Amichai Chikli, a politician in Israel who is in charge of diaspora affairs for Israel, says a combination of the radical left and radical Islam has meant Jews no longer feel safe in the capital. His sentiments are echoed by polling from the National Jewish Assembly, with almost half of respondents concluding there is no long-term future for Jewish people in the United Kingdom. Joining me now is Lance Foreman, a former MEP and businessman. Lance, welcome to the Independent Republican, Mike Graham. Always a pleasure. Mike. Always good to see you. Um, this is an extraordinary situation, and I can't even believe we're sitting here about to discuss what I've just said, that London has become a difficult and possibly dangerous place for Jewish people to live. It, it is very difficult, and it, it is a conversation that Jewish people right across London are having every single day, you know. Mm. I might be fine, but is this going to be a place for my children, my yeah. grandchildren? And I'll tell you why we think that and what goes through our head. Yeah. Um, you know, this is very personal to me. My dad was a Holocaust survivor. Yeah. Uh, he lost more than half his family in Auschwitz, mm. um, just murdered because they were Jewish for no other reason. And the question that a lot of Jewish people ask, having learned from history, is that when things were getting bad in Germany, they felt they were so sort of ingrained mm. in German society yes. that, oh, it's, nothing's going to happen to them. Right. And then a few shops got firebombed and, you know, Jewish kids were sort of weren't allowed to go to universities and there were boycotts against mm. Jews. And they all said it's not going to happen to them, and then it did. And mm. it, they left it too late to leave. Right. He was one of the lucky ones, got out early, but they left it too late. And as a result, six million Jews across Europe a third of the entire global Jewish population was wiped out. So every Jewish person, not only in London, in every city across Europe, right. is all thinking, hmm, this looks like history repeating itself. Yeah. Is there a future for us or should we leave? And mm. if so, where do we go? Should we go to Israel or you know, right. anywhere else? And Israel is obviously a difficult place to live, presumably at the moment as well, because the rocket attacks continue. Um, the threat, as Melanie Phillips, I thought, very eloquently put on, on Question Time last week, uh, the threat is there that Hamas will come back. They've said they will. Uh, they're not interested in peace. They're not interested in a two-state solution. They're not interested in anything but the wiping out of Israel as a, as a nation and the wiping out of, of Jewish people. That's right. I, I have a son that lives in Jerusalem. Uh. And I'll tell you what, he thinks that he's safer there with the rockets than we are wow. in London. I mean, that is, ex that is really mm. quite extraordinary. And that's a feeling that a, a, a lot of Jewish people have. Mm. They just sort of feel safer, you know, all together right. in Israel, fighting their fight and, you know, hoping that their allies will stick, you know, strongly with yeah. them. But at the moment, you know, it's, uh, the support is, is, uh, is waning. Well, this um, is the trouble, isn't it? Because we, we heard very sort of early on, I suppose, in November, perhaps, that, you know, uh, is Hamas winning the, the, the war of, of public relations? Which at the time, you know, I was kind of very um, dismissive of. I was like, well, of course they're not. You know, these are horrific, ghastly terrorists. How could they possibly be winning a war uh, of, of public relations against a democratic nation? But they are. The problem is there is a lot of deep-seated anti-Semitism. And as you said at the start, you know, it comes both from Islamism within the UK yeah. and also from the left. I mean, um, 
you, you're probably familiar with the um, journalist broadcaster Mehdi Hassan. Yes. Uh, he wrote a, a piece in the New Statesman a number of years out ago. He got his show in America, didn't he? He did. He's back here in the UK, and I think he's doing work with The Guardian. But mm. he wrote a piece in the New Statesman a few years ago, and these are his words, not mine. Yeah. He said that anti-Semitism in the Muslim community, the Muslim British community, is, his words, our dirty little secret. Mm. Now, it's not a secret anymore. You know, the, the night of October the 7th, so before Israel, you know, mm. is, Israel took three weeks to respond. They had to work out, you know, what are we going to do following this tragedy, you yes. know, the, the greatest, uh, you know, murder of Jews since mm. the Holocaust. Um, that very night, there were thousands of people protesting in London mm. against the yeah. Israeli embassy, cheering and celebrating the massacre yeah. um, in Israel. They and were they've been doing it for the last 24 weeks. Well, they have. I mean, uh, very early on, you know, there were posters of, you know, the hostages, yeah. young, you know, kids. I remember. Older women, posters going up saying, we've got to get our hostages yeah. out. And people were tearing I those know. posters down before Israel had started, you know, its defensive war yeah. to try and remove Hamas. So, you know, you, you have it within, uh, you know, not across the entire Muslim community, of course not. No. Um, but it is um, there within certain aspects of the uh, Islamic community mm. in the UK. And, and also on the left, and, and also I'll tell you what, Mike, one of the biggest, I think, one of the biggest instigators of this, and it's not just in recent years, it's been going for a long time, mm. is the BBC. Yes. Well, I was going to get on to the BBC because, of course, this very week a Tory MP has called for the suspension of those two uh, BBC Arabic journalists who were celebrating as well on October the 7th, you know, liking tweets about, you know, this is the beginning of the uprising against Israel, you know, liking tweets about Hamas uh, being freedom fighters and all this kind of thing. Um, and it looks as though there's been something like 130 apologies, is that right? There, there, there have been 130 corrections. Corrections, I've, I've um, over two. That's over, you know, over two a week. Yeah. You know, it, the BBC is consistently getting it wrong, and you have to ask why there is, in mm. my view, there is institutional anti-Semitism within the BBC. And I'll tell you why this is so important. Yeah. It's because the BBC are widely regarded globally mm. uh, as the sort of gold standard yes. of journalism. Right. Now, if they can be anti-Semitic and demonise Israel and delegitimise Israel, which they've been doing for decades now, yeah. it empowers every other media organisation across the world to do mm. the same thing. And here's an interesting thing. BBC has a channel, BBC Arabic. Yes. It has 40 million viewers, right. listeners and uh, viewers. Now, BBC Arabic is never going to be pro-Israel. Right. At best, it'll be neutral, but of course, it's not going to be neutral either because of its audience. Yeah. BBC Arabic's funded by the licence fee payer. Yeah. Why should I be paying for the sort of absolute junk for propaganda. and bias that it's just yeah. churning out week mm. after week, even if the BBC in the UK isn't, you know... We can complain about that too, you know, not calling Hamas terrorists. Well, they did that for weeks. Still, well, they still don't call them terrorists. They now just say that they're prescribed as a terrorist group by the government. It's outrageous. They still don't call them terrorists. And the other thing that I found astonishing, and I mention it as often as I can, Jeremy Bowen, who used to be a very fine, upstanding, you know, straight-on reporter, seems to have gone completely over to the other side because he reported, did he not, uh, that an Israeli bomb had hit a hospital, killing 500 people when, in fact, not only was there no bomb, there was no 500 dead, um, a missile had misfired from Correct. Islamic, Islamic Jihad, Jihad. Yeah. into yeah. a car park, not the hospital. And worse than that, when he actually uh, was quizzed about it later, uh, he said he didn't regret getting it wrong. Yeah. And he didn't apologise for getting it wrong. And the effect of that report that was put out very quickly and speedily before they could check it was that there were people burning flags in, in Tehran, you know, people demonstrating in Egypt, impact. people Absolutely. demonstrating in Tunisia about this horror that the Israelis had carried out. And I don't understand how the BBC can allow it to happen. But we also know that there was a report written about the BBC a long time ago, um, maybe 20 years ago, right? Yeah. Uh, it's been asked for several times. The BBC won't re release it. It was a report into anti-Semitism at the BBC. That's right. But they say they won't release it because they needed to keep the confidentiality of journalists. This is nonsense. I mean, so this is not a new... This is, you know, the BBC's anti... Zionism, anti-Semitism is not a new thing. This has been going on for decades, mm. and it's been brushed under the carpet. They, they, you're absolutely right. So it was about, I think it was 2003, yeah. having received numerous complaints about their bias, decided to commission a report, yeah. and they hired one of their journalists, a guy called Malcolm Balin. Mm. He listened to hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage, and he wrote this, I think, 20,000-word report. It, this report has never, ever seen the light of day. Mm. There was a challenge, a freedom of information challenge. The BBC spent 
almost half a million pounds worth of licence fee payers' money mm. to defend this thing and stop this thing seeing the light of day. Now, the BBC have had so many scandals in recent years, you know, right. Jimmy Savile, well, um, I mean, Martin I, I Bashir. Well, I started running through know. them, but I didn't even get to Hugh Edwards <laughs> well, before exactly. I'd filled an entire page. But the, the, they, they keep saying how they want to be transparent. Yeah. Well, why aren't you transparent with this? Why are you brushing it under the carpet and hiding it? We have anti-Semitism in the UK now higher than at any mm. level ever in the history of this country, yes. probably since 1290. And don't forget, it was only this week in front of the uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport Committee uh, that Tim Davey, the Director-General, said he thought they were doing a pretty good job of impartiality. They're, they're doing an outrageously bad job. Ah. This thing, you know, just on transparency alone, there, there must be a public interest given anti-Semitism, uh, the levels it, uh, is, it's at at the moment, there must be a public interest right. in releasing this report. Now, the fact is, this report is 20 years old. Mm. So you're protecting journalists that probably don't even work in the yeah. BBC anymore. And if they really do, we'll redact their names. But we want to see what did the report say, what recommendations were made, and did the BBC follow right. those recommendations? Because I don't believe they did, or they, you know, they can't be, because... They are just churning out mm. factual inaccuracies, demonising Israel the entire time. And here's another interesting thing. You know, I've been to Israel many times with politicians just to show them what it's like on the ground. Yeah. And it's incredible. You know, the minute they arrive and they walk along the beachfront in Tel Aviv and they see Arabs and Jews friendly playing side football on side, the beach yeah. side by side, they sort of say, well, this isn't what I was expecting. Yeah. You never see that on the BBC. No. And the same, when you see Gaza on the BBC, all you see, this is pre-war, you saw the place sort of totally decrepit and mm. buildings and the place looking like a war zone. You never saw the luxury flats and no. the swimming pools and the lovely hotels. There was a lot of that. Mm. It was made out to be this sort of, you know, this open prison. But, you know, there are websites where you can actually see mm. what really goes on. Yeah. You never see it on the BBC. It's extraordinary. We could talk about this all night, but we unfortunately could. we're out of time. Lance, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. And, and good luck with the business and everything else that you're doing in London. Um, and we will see uh, how this all plays out. But it's not good. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham. I'll tell you why the Tory party's killed itself coming up next. And we'll be discussing the largest gold nugget ever found in England. Yes, it's Talk TV, the place to be. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for Taking the Mic. You might say they have brought it all on themselves. The ongoing demise of the Tory party, culminating today with the news that they've plunged to a new low this year of 19% in the polls. It's the result of a series of self-harms inflicted since the days of the coalition. The party's betrayal of Conservative values began with David Cameron and will end with Rishi Sunak. How ironic that they will both be in the last Conservative government as it shuffles off into oblivion later this year. It could have all been so different, of course. If only they had listened to the people... The voters, those who put their faith in a Tory party that has so carelessly tossed them aside in favour of an agenda that has been neither Conservative nor Unionist. Consider the betrayal of Northern Ireland, now run by a party sworn to unite Ireland and start the inevitable destruction of the United Kingdom. Of course, it was Boris Johnson that allowed that particular betrayal of Britain after Brexit was botched under his reign. Consider David Cameron's ludicrous intervention in Libya in 2011. Ill-judged, dangerous and widely blamed for the beginning of the global migrant crisis that is now wrecking Western Europe. Consider the Ramona Tory MPs who betrayed the Brexit referendum and were still attempting to block our departure from the European Union as late as 2019. And consider the headlong rush to placate the eco-nutters that has resulted in the most costly and ridiculous rush towards the unattainable net-zero goal ordered by the globalists and the United Nations. All of the above manoeuvres have contributed to the death of the Conservative Party. George Osborne plunged another dagger into the party of business when he conspired to invent more red tape than anyone else had ever seen for small business in this country while he was Chancellor. And the fact that we are now taxed at a higher rate than at any time since the Second World War is an utter scandal for anyone who calls themselves a Conservative. The Reform Party is just four points behind the Tories now, and you wouldn't bet they won't overtake them before the election, which is widely expected to be held on October the 17th. The Labour Party are 25 points ahead and seemingly unstoppable, despite revealing hardly any policy on anything. In the words of Sean Connery, the Tory party is as dead as Julius Caesar. They can't stop the boats. The highest number of illegal migrants this year crossed the Channel only yesterday. Another 500-plus to add to the hundreds of thousands already here. They can't reduce NHS waiting times. They can't stimulate growth. All they can do is continue to expand the state, waste more of our money and betray the very people that put them in charge. So I say this, stick a fork in them, they're done. And now, I'd like to bring this to your attention. Tonight, Talk TV launches a brand new show where Sir Keir Starmer will be talking to the Sun's Harry Cole on the first episode of his new show, Never Mind the Ballots. Here's a taste of what's to come. Never mind the ballots. A brand new look at all things politics from the sun with me, Harry Cole. This week, watch my exclusive interview with Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer with no topic off limits. Tune in on Thursday evening exclusively with the sun. That's coming up right after this show, of course. In other news, the beautiful hills of Shropshire with an old cranky metal detector, a man has discovered the world's biggest nugget of gold. Absolutely elated, Mr Richard Brock has put it up for a small fortune for auction. The nugget has been named... Hero, and should mean Mr Brock can settle down comfortably for a good while. Joining me now is the man who will be auctioning the nugget. Auctioneer, Mr Ben Jones. Ben, very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Very nice to see you. Now, I mean, it's pretty unusual to find anything worth a fag end when people go out with metal detectors. I mean, I see them every weekend on the beach, scouring around looking for stuff. I've never seen anybody actually finding anything. Um, but this guy's absolutely struck gold. How much do you reckon the nugget is worth? Uh, very difficult to say. Um, the best way of doing it is, is put it into auction and, uh, you know, let the market decide. 
Um, obviously, the estimate is there to hopefully try and attract people to come and bid. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll uh, be able to get a good result for uh, Rich and um, we'll see how it goes, yeah. Right. But, I mean, the estimate of the value so far that I've seen is around about, what, 30,000 quid? That's the estimate, yeah. Yeah. So, what, you could go for more than that just because it's unusual? Potentially, yeah. I mean, this is a joy of an auction. Um, to a degree, you know, you get buyers that come and buy from auction that um, are buying the, you know, the... the, the uh, it's the thrill of the chase and the hunt rather than the actual kill. Yes. Um, exactly when they're, you know, looking, scouring the uh, floor and the beaches. Um, is it kind of addictive to be trying to find something, the gamble of trying to find something? Um, it's a similar feeling when you go to auction. You, you put it out there, you let people decide. Obviously, yes, some people are going to be interested, others aren't. Um, and you're just trying to make it uh, as inviting for people as you can. Right. I mean, have you ever auctioned anything like this before? Because I'm assuming that it's not every day that people find this stuff. I mean, if I thought there was nuggets of gold lying around in Shropshire, uh, I'd be up there tomorrow having a look. But I presume lots of other people are probably doing that already. Quite right, yeah. No, this is uh, uh, certainly the first of uh, um, you know first item like this we've had. Uh, we've sold boats in the past, um, sold it for the RNLI, which was great. But, but usually, yes, it's uh, um, sort of football shirts, football medals, caps... Uh, rugby shirts, and, right. uh, and we stick to sort of the sporting side of things, really. Oh, OK. So, will you have to adopt a slightly different sort of tenor when you when you auction this, then? Well, how, give, us a, give us a sort of a, a taste of what it will sound no, so, like. so, slightly different, this one. Uh, it won't be a live auction. It's a timed sale. Um, it's in a sale on its own, so it will just sit there for a couple of weeks and, and basically sort of count down um, until the bidding will, will finish ending on the 1st of April, although it isn't a joke. Um, and we'll finish <laughs> at, at sort of six o'clock on, on the first of April. I've got your gavel there. So. I've got mine here as well. I've got a gavel as well. So I'm hoping that you might be able to teach me a little bit about how to use that gavel. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. How to get, uh, I mean, I'm a bit disappointed. It's not. It's not going to be. It's going to be like a silent auction. Then, by what you're saying. Yeah, it, it's similar. Similar to the likes of, of sort of eBay. Yeah, it'll just be run. Um, you know, That's it gives boring. people a good chance to, to have a look at something, and uh, um, you know, gives them time to make up their mind. Yes. And so, I mean, my panel have now just come back to me. Uh, they've got cash to splash on the largest golden nugget ever discovered in the Independent Republic. Uh, and you can see it there. Very good. Um, now, it might wow. not be worth yeah. quite as much as... Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, look, he's done this before, <laughs> hasn't he? Have you been on QVC? <laughs> um, so I've got a gavel here. So what I want you to do, Ben, uh, is give me a quick burst of how you would actually do it if it was a live auction, right? Um, okay, and 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 you, you can you can give me a sort of couple of hints, and then I'll see if I can auction it off to, to any of them and see uh, um, if Tom, Alice, and Sam actually want to, to have a piece of the action. Oh, you got some money well, as well. Yeah, first of all, you've got... You, you've got to tell them that is the most important, the rare and scarce item that you've ever seen. It's the best golden nugget that you've ever seen before. You're not going to find another one like it. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. So. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Independent Republic's first ever auction of the Golden Nugget. Um, this, as you can see, is the best Golden Nugget you've ever seen in your entire life. You'll never see a better one. Um, and quite frankly, I don't know what price it will go for because it is absolutely and utterly incredible. Now, when I'm conducting the auction, Ben, do I have to speak with a slightly yeah. faster tenor than that? So, so show me how you would no, do it. No, 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 you don't. Obviously, the, the livestock boys, when they're selling cattle and sheep, Ooh. yes, they... Uh, yeah, they, they do it really well. Of, uh, Can you do that? They, they yeah, they got the... They got the uh, the, the, the roll tongue and everything else. But it's not like that in our game as such. Right. Um, we need so you to don't give do people it a bit more time to make up. All that stuff, you don't do no, that? No, 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 no. We, we like, you know, you, you're trying to, <laughs> yes, you're trying to move things along, speed it up, get people bidding, because you don't want to be sitting there and just waiting. You want right. to get the bids out of them, draw the bids out of them, bid now, bid and now, And what do they have to do? Now, do they have to go like that? Do they go like that for, for an auction bid? Uh, when alive, yes, yeah. Either a nod if they if a they nod? can catch your eye and you can right. catch that. So I've got to be quite acceptable. aware, quite alert to all that. All right. So yeah, should we get yeah, on? Absolutely. Should we get on? And give it a try. Give all it a right. go. Give it okay. A so this is on Ben's advice. So welcome to the uh, Independent Republic auction. I'm, I, I'm, I'm. What am I bid? Am I bid uh, ten pounds for the golden nugget? Yes, 200. I have Sam. 200. I have two hundred from Alice. Um, I have Mike Graham's currency. Ten. Sorry, <laughs> it's Graham's. Two hundred. Five thousand Graham. Five thousand Graham. Ten thousand Graham. Ten thousand uh, from Alice. Um, Tom, what are you going to go for? 
Ten thousand. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand um, for the golden nugget. The we'll go in together nugget. and do yeah, 15, fifteen thousand. We'll share it. We'll share it. Thousand going once. Fifteen thousand going twice. Oh. Have you got any more, Tom? Can you give me any more? Oh. Oh. Uh, that's for you. Personally. That's for me personally. Thank you very much indeed. It's David Dickinson. Um, I'll take that and put it away somewhere for later. It's sold to the man in the dark jacket. Um, uh, Mr. Tom has won. Uh, of course, it's a fantastic thing that he's got. Um, it is, of course, going, going, and it's gone. You can take the take the gold. Tom Slater has won the golden nugget with fifteen pound, fifteen thousand grams, and <laughs> oh, one really <laughs> heavy. Really heavy. There you go. Be careful. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drop it on your foot. Are you sure? So, <laughs> Tom Slater. <laughs> there you go. How did you think that went to a bed? Beautiful. If you want a job, you know where to, you know where to come and... Uh, uh, if you want something to do the weekend, then you come and see us. Thank you very Perfect. much. Very nice indeed. Uh, Tom, how does it feel to be the owner of the biggest golden nugget in Shropshire? It's good, you know. It's, um, <laughs> it's a lot lighter than I imagined. Yes. It's, well, it maybe it's been hollowed out by it's Sam. A, it's, a gold, it's, a gold, it. it's a gold blend. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's gold-plated nuggets. I think, <laughs> you know. It's an Easter egg that's melted. Yes. Like, but, um, it may well be a potato in there, in there but uh, don't, un I think I've, I've don't been, unwrap it. I think I've been same, ripped off. Would be my advice. an Easter egg these days. Well, that was good. I, also, I made a few quid out of that as well. So thank it turned you very into much a bribe indeed. rather than a bit. Yeah, that's know. fine. That's entirely in, in keeping with the benign dictatorship that is the independent <laughs> republic. If anybody else wants to bribe me, feel free. Uh, obviously, that's just a joke if you're watching from the regulatory authorities. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Find out what fantastic idea the England football team have come up with. And we're talking Emmanuel Macron's muscles. You won't want to miss it. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. He would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for this. The world of woke. How do you know when you're making too much money? I'll tell you. You start ordering your own personalised fragrance. You pay for it out of some bloated bank account, the same one that you paid for your diamond earrings, your personalised number plates and your swimming pools. The world of woke, of course, is no different. This time, though, it's England's footballers that are in the frame. And they're not just spending money for their own enjoyment. They have headed down that long and overpopulated rabbit hole known as mental well-being. It's a racket that only the mega-rich can afford. The European Championships are coming up in Germany in June and the England bosses have come up with an idea which is utterly bizarre, even for them. Get this, our pampered heroes are taking their own perfume with them to recreate the sweet smell of um, success. The trouble is, last time out in 2020, they only managed the sweet smell of failure. They lost in the final to Italy. Of course, there are some in the sporting world that consider being runners-up to be some kind of victory. Unfortunately, some of them are at the very top of the management tree. But for all their talk of journeys and inclusion, there can only ever be one winner of the Euros. And that would probably be the team that wins it. This year's team of multi-millionaires will be staying in five-star luxury at their base and they're not messing around. They're not just bringing one perfume, they're bringing three. The first will be present in the main areas of their hotel. The signature scent will contain hints of bergamot, lily and jasmine. It's described as a fresh, comforting aroma that is distinguishable and lets you know you're in a high-end space, just where they all want to be. Seriously, the second scent is a more energising aroma which will be used for gym and recreational work. And the third, with hints of lavender, is to be wafted around the players' bedrooms to help them sleep. The people behind all this mumbo-jumbo claim that all these pleasant aromas will promote mental well-being. They're even suggesting there's a link between the fragrance and improved athletic performance. It's nice work if you can get it. Probably pays a pretty penny too. But the pampered poodles will have to do without their Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces for the month, of course, while they're ferried around in coaches to and from the games. No word yet on what they will smell like. We've certainly come a long way since the days of Kevin Keegan splashing it all over him with Brute 33 after a communal shower. Will it make any difference? Of course it won't. The world of woke. I mean, I don't know where to start with this. I mean, what on earth are they thinking? Why on earth do they need their own scent? This, well, they probably looked back in history and thought, let's go back, see what the, the great England teams of posterity... And yes. Maybe that was the difference. In well, I can't six, imagine the world... That they all had their own signature Bobby and Jackie scent. Charlton with their own, you know, signature scent. <laughs> <laughs> when you first said their scent, I actually thought that they were creating a scent from, from, the, from their own bodily because, and because smells. Because the, that's what happened in the Roman Empire with the gladiators. Mm. They were so popular, they literally used to have little vials of a sweat to sell oh, to really? the fangirls. Yeah. Well, I'm sure so that would be quite compared, popular. If... Compared to the gladiators. Yeah. You know, it's not too of, bad. There is, there is <laughs> method of the madness, I think, a little bit, in that they, the scents are supposed to create... Um, they, that's, that's what they. It's, that's what it smells like in their own club, basically. And that's what when they when they when. But I presume the, it doesn't though. When they're, when they're up, it's supposed because to they've invented. It's supposed to recreate their home from home, so they therefore they feel at home. They don't feel like they're in some sort of smelly foreign hotel. Well, yeah, except um, that it's like except bergamot, that it's not what they're used Lily, to, is it? I mean, the, the bergamot Jasmine. one smells. It, it's, it looks <laughs> to me. New smells. It looks to me like one of the Joe Malone's that the people buy. Isn't, isn't, a jo I mean, isn't there a Joe Malone one with bergamot and jasmine? You know, huh? these like floral scents mm. are quite feminine. I'm wondering if it will be go down very well with the kind of football. Well, I mean, football they're crowd. not exactly, you know, what you might call romantic types, are they? I, mean, <laughs> I, don't, know if Carl, I don't know if Carl Walker's going to be there with his new girlfriend or his really other kids <laughs> or his ex wife or, you know, well, he's, but he's got a diamond earring. I just don't think that, you know, whatever money they're wasting on this cobblers, I mean, how is it going to have any effect on them? This comes, by the way, on top of the, the other problem. Um, where Nike have put out a, a, um, an England shirt with a flag of St George in the wrong colours, deliberately. That's, that's embarrassing. Because they're harking back to supposedly what the um, what this 1966 <laughs> team trained in, mm -hmm. which is a sort of red and blue and purple. But it looks suspiciously like an LGBT type sort of scenario, mm. and they're not going to change it. And even Keir Starmer's critical of it. Well, it's a lot of superstition, isn't it, really? And I think, and a lot of football is. I mean, I'm not a massive football fan, but a lot of it is to do with superstition. I've watched, I've watched games with a friend of mine, friends of mine. Yeah. I think I was wearing a pale blue shirt, and he was mm. like, "That's a Chelsea colour or yeah. something," and right. I had to take it off and a big hoo ha. Right. But like, but I, well, like, I mean, but I like what the difference, though, isn't there, between putting your left sock on first and having bergamot yeah. jasmine floating? But also, which I'm sure is lovely. But like, but like. 
you, but like you say on the on the coach, I, mean, I don't know if anyone's been on a long coach journey where uh, where, where where solids are allowed in the um in the on in the onboard toilet. Mm. It doesn't smell. It doesn't smell. I like that, this. But, is going. The, burger one, lav- the burger one lavender will feel like a yeah. scent of the past. Yeah. By the time I find they- it hilarious knowing that our England team will be smelling of lilies and bergamot. And jasmine. Yeah. <laughs> what is that saying about our men? Oh, they'll, they'll, supposedly they'll lose, but they'll great smell English great. Men. Well, they do. Like Does lilies. it not tell you that the, the, the Gareth Southgate is finally flipped? You know, because of all the ridiculous things he's come up with, this is the worst. The pressure's finally got to him. Yeah. He's, he's, he's gone on a, you know, a weekend away, testing out various different scents, yeah. and he thinks this is the answer. Unbelievable. Okay. I'm happy that they're going no, to smell sweet. About Emmanuel Macron, because, I mean, he is another person that you might think is constantly <laughs> surrounded by scent, being Look a Frenchman, him. you know. Um, but apparently he's released a rather indulgent study of himself displaying his what's called ultimate virility in his new muscles. Have we got a picture? Shall we have a look? Very small is Emmanuel Macron, isn't he? I mean, one of the reasons that Rishi Sunak likes him so much and the reason Macron <laughs> likes him so much is that they, they can speak without having to kind of stand on a box because they're about the same height. But he's looking very moody, isn't he? It's all, <laughs> all sort of French philosopher sort of there. Sort of Jean-Paul Belmondo. You're probably too young to remember him, but he was a French film star. Um, who played everything from sort of gangsters to um, Jean-Paul Belmondo. Very cool guy, actually. Yeah. But, but Ma- Emmanuel Macron is no Jean-Paul Belmondo. More, more Jean-Paul Gaultier, perhaps. Uh, more Jean- well, Jean-Paul Gaultier is a bit more interesting, I think. But also, also the Jean-Paul Gaultier ads have all the, have all the, big, the big bicep muscles. Yes. I mean, I think you could, you know, you could, you could, there's a case to be made for that. I think it looks quite sexy, Do you actually. think you do? OK, well, I'll yeah, take your word for it. Yeah. I mean, I it doesn't do anything for me, I'm afraid. There's something slightly suspicious of trying to, you know, portray... <laughs> political power through masculine yes. terms, but it's very, you know, it's very archaic-sizing, I think. I mean, but Rishi Sunak does it a different say, way, doesn't he? Well, that's well, the thing. I'm a bit embarrassed now. I think Rishi ought to ought to publish some... Did you some, not... Well, him on the some, peloton. Sorry, did you not publish some photos? The first, video, the first video when he was going for leadership, when he had the bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, but oh, I mean, that was, was that was his moment. Was there also not a funny moment where him and Zelensky were walking towards a helicopter, both dressed in sort of full battle yeah, well, yes. <laughs> And it looked like sort of, you know... The Thunderbirds are going. Thunderbirds are yeah, going. Sure. It was a bit like that, yeah. That sort of proportions. But, you know, at least he's hitting the... He apparently is into boxing, Emmanuel Macron. He seems like he's hit the... There was that terrible video of Keir Starmer trying to punch. Punch bag. Yes. And if you ever want to laugh, do watch really that. it was really bad, wasn't it? Really bad. It looked like he was literally That looked passing. a lot better. Yeah, so, Boris Johnson uh, was somebody who liked a bit of, um, you know, image building, didn't he? Here he was boxing. I don't know quite what... Uh, uh, <laughs> he's leading with his left, yeah. you know. Uh, he's not got some great... He's not got great... He's also his shirt hanging Yeah, out why is he doing it in a shirt at yeah. all? That's... Well, the thing is with these guys, everything they do is quite carefully choreographed, yeah. you know. I, say, I don't mind the Boris boxing, actually. I think it's quite, it's yeah. quite cool. I would, I would imagine Rishi Sunak, you'd see him sort of down at Muscle Beach in uh, Santa Monica, <laughs> you know, pulling himself up and down on those little, <laughs> you know, those little bars. Because, I mean, that's really where he wants to be, isn't it? Wasn't, I mean, he, wasn't he spotted at some sort of Taylor Swift-themed exercise class? He was, when he was, in when he was there, America. yeah. Yeah, and in fact, so, was it not something that everybody thought Taylor Swift was going to turn up to? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it was, uh, you know... Turn, turn right round again. Yeah, it? which, of course, she didn't. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like... I, I'm not I'm not in favour of these politicians actually yeah, pretending it's... to be, you know, interested in anything other than just megalomaniacal <laughs> political... Exactly. It's you know, sincere, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I think the, 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 the black and white as well. It's like when, you know, David Cameron right, pretends to be a football fan. You know, and he oh, couldn't yeah. remember the team. He knew they played in Claret and Blue, but he couldn't remember... Couldn't work out Villa, Villa or, yeah. or West Ham. Um... <laughs> What about... Um, oh, here we go. There's, there's uh, Boris and Macron. That's definitely not... I mean, that picture has been retouched. I'm going to have to call in the <laughs> Princess of Wales to judge this one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it does look as though something's happened to that picture on the left. Um, let's talk about Elon Musk. He's got a brain implant company. Um, now, this should probably worry quite a lot of people, shouldn't it? it is, this is the Neuralink, something he's yeah, been right, working yeah. on in the background for um, a long he time. Apparently, he's, he's been able to show a video of a paralysed patient using technology to play chess on a computer. And that so is it's incredible. it's quite interesting. Because you do... People tend to sort of jump to the most apocalyptic conclusion when you hear about technology yeah. like this. But obviously, if you're talking about someone who can't move any of their limbs, something like this enabling them to yeah. use a computer... You can see this is, the, uh, this is the clip Why not? in question. Yeah, it's all good. I mean, I suppose that the trouble with people who... Think about they, they see Elon Musk as a bit of a sort of dangerous character, don't they? They think he's some kind of you know sort of master of uh, time, space, and dimension. Lives in a volcano. And he somewhere, lives in a volcano you know, somewhere, yeah. and he strikes a cat. <laughs> and if you know, if you put something in in your brain, you know, it'll program you to do something really weird or something. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just me. 
program you to tweet <laughs> incessantly. I think it's, until, it's, you know. it's, it's the few, we're just like for, at the moment we have wearables. You know, wearables are you know your your Apple you know watch whatever. Yeah. Like this is I've you got know, one for my car. This is an insertable perhaps. It's like you've got you know. I, it's the future. Well, if this, is the, if this got, is the future of technology and, we, and, we, guy, and we're benefited, then why not? Is there not a guy... I'm pretty sure I've seen a, a story on this guy who's got a, a, a sort of chip and pin chip embra emblazoned or, or put it in, planted oh, yeah, into yeah. his... Next to his thumb, so he just has to go like that to pay for things. I, something strikes me. I'm like, well, all you have to do is that anyway, to... but with a card. So why yeah. would you make sure yeah. somebody put it in your hand? Yeah, but that's what that's what we used to say about putting in the pin number. Now, if you ask putting your pin number, you're like, oh. Really? Ooh, yeah. beep, beep, beep. <laughs> I know, it's true, actually. Yeah, when I, I used think, to go to I America, it's been baffled because they'd make you sign on this ridiculous yeah. sort of... Like know, the 80s? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm all for technological innovation. Yeah. But I think when you something want a chip becomes... You wouldn't your head, though, would you? Never in my life. No. I think when something becomes in, in part of you, permeating your flesh, yeah. I think that's something quite different from just a convenient Because I would worry, I mean, genuinely, as, as much as we all are in favour of technological advance, you would worry that something that was actually embedded inside you yeah, well, was doing that, something also, other than just also, giving you instructions. Yeah. We already have as, that now with a pacemaker. But as, as technology you becomes... Pacemaker? No, but people, you look very people, well for that. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I, I think, I think that for, medical, for medical yeah, reasons... Yeah, but that's to save your life. You're not going to go, I'm not yeah. having one of those. <laughs> no, just stay away. Yeah, no, I think for medical reasons, <laughs> it's understandable. But I have also seen that our companies already making microchips yeah. for political purposes, especially to do with, with credit cards and, right. and tracking. Yes. And I think, you know, I think it offends the dignity of the human being. We're not, you know, we don't need to be chipped. We don't, no. I think there's something really sinister about that. I mean, and you chip a dog, don't you? The you issue is that this human. technology is so powerful, it can fall into the wrong hands. This right. is not a joke. It does Also, happen. look at all the things that are going on at the moment. You know, we've had Greg's was been the latest when one they couldn't use contactless cars. But if you've got a chip in your head and mm. suddenly it's, it's rendered yeah. well, useless, I think, I think that's a good, cyber attack. That's a good guard against ever actually, any of this technology ever actually supposedly, you know, taking over because it's all actually quite naff at the same time. It doesn't yeah. work very well. Right. Probably get a, your chip would probably get a virus. Probably. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of technology like this. So, like, it, obviously, mm. it's going to be a bit faulty to begin with. But, but, but as you say, if you don't, if you don't want it, don't have it. But if, if I could have a chip and I could, you know, I didn't have to wear glasses or I could see through that wall, then why not? Okay. Right. <laughs> I will write you down for. Make me a scene of you. I'm up for it. Write you down as a possible, shall I? <laughs> I, 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 just, I think with people well, like. It doesn't interfere with a yeah. pacemaker. <laughs> no, not yeah. the two. <laughs> the two combined. Also, you don't want to see through walls because that could be some problems. I mean, he there's, there's a big advocate for this sort of stuff. I think the digitalisation of. Of, of the human being, mm. you know, this Klaus Schwab. <laughs> yes. I think he says some rather frightening things he does. about the power of technology. He and does. He's not going to be around for much longer, though. I wouldn't worry too much sphere. about him. You know, he doesn't so. look like he's any danger to anybody, frankly. But there we are. Um, I think we're all done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Thank you Alice. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, we've, of course, got a new show coming up after this because it is the one and only um, um, Mr Harry Cole from The Sun uh, who's got an interview with Keir Starmer. Never mind the ballots is what it's called. And it comes right up after this one. And, of course, tomorrow night I'll be back here at 7pm uh, with Plank of the week, as ever. That's all from me tonight, though. You've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you to all the guests that we had. I'll be back, of course, as I said, tomorrow night, 7pm, and then back on Monday at 8, right here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
may might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fort.